while to look and see what it was Gavin was asking me to talk about here. So I have been working on this in the context of a consultant for, M uh, for Biogen. Um, I also have other things that I do, um, but I obviously with Biogen, I was looking at it in the context of PML, not necessarily in the context of MS. So this was sort of an interesting uh, exercise. Um, and a lot of what I'll say is very speculative, but there's sort of a thread that I think is beginning to sort of perhaps emerge. So as I mentioned, I consult for Biogen. Um, this is to sort of remind you about uh, lymphocytes binding to the endothelium, it's sort of to get you into the mood of uh, cellular uh, uh, sort of biology. Um, Again, to remind you that uh, there's a lot that's involved in cells binding to the endothelium. Um, I'm going to be focusing on, whoops, no laser, on the middle where it's, where on, on the L, uh, VLA4, VCAM uh, axis. Um, but don't forget about the LFA1 ICAM axis as well as it, in terms of adhesion molecules. This is to remind you about natalizumab. It's a monoclonal antibody that binds to one of these cell surface proteins that's on lymphocytes um, as well as uh, other kinds of cells. But it, uh, the natalizumab binds to the alpha-4 subunit of uh, VLA-4. And when you add natalizumab uh, to people or to cell cultures, test tubes, it binds to the uh, alpha-4, the VLA-4, and it blocks the adhesion to VCAM. That's the proposed mechanism. It likely does a number of other things, but that's the most obvious mechanism. And that's one of the reasons, I think, for Gavin's thinking that natalizumab can teach us a lot about MS because it's an antagonist. When you have an agonist, you bind to something and lots of things happen, for example, with interferon. You bind interferon beta to a cell, there's 1,500 transcriptional changes. Which is the one that's important in MS? Which is the one important for particular patients? But with natalizumab, you have an antagonist, so you have a real clear target. So it's, again, we think it's a clear target. It's probably more complicated, but we have a way to begin to think about what is this drug doing and how does it affect the disease, and therefore, what is the disease? So just again, uh, background is to, and I can do some background because the data I've sort of extracted to address the question of pathogenesis um, is not very, you know, it's not, it's not deep. It's, it's interesting, but it's not deep. So I can remind you that cell trafficking requires, I, in general, again, very simplistically, three steps. You have to have adhesion molecules on your, on your leukocyte. Um, and I'm talking primarily about blood-brain barrier uh, trafficking. Um, you have to have a ligand for that on the endothelium. And you have to, and this is what people forget, you have to have a signal. Now, do some cells sort of wander in and out without a signal? I'm not sure. But, if, but most of us think that you need to have some kind of chemokine, cytokine signal that pulls the cells from the uh, blood into the tissue. And so people should not figure and not forget about the signals. And the signals are quite specific. Viruses elicit certain signals. Some different lymphocytes, leukocytes, recognize that specific signal, and then that will go in. So you need that signal as well, and that provides specificity as well. So people shouldn't forget that. Um, so here's my super simplistic view. I'm, I'm trained as a biochemist, not an immunologist. So I view immunology very simplistically. Um, uh, in untreated MS, let's say that most cells can get in. There's no real blockade if they have the right signals. And if there's some inflammatory signal to upregulate the ligands, then there's no reason that cells can't get in. Um, do all cells get in? It depends on the signals, probably. Um, in in natalizumab-treated patients, almost all the cells that we look at are, are, can be blocked. And so 
I have the, own, the other thing that I've written here is, these are, this is speculative, but tissue resident, and maybe I was thinking Dr. DeLuca might be able to, tissue resident cells. Are there tissue resident cells? Ah, good, thank you. Ah. Are there tissue resident cells in people, normal, healthy controls, MS, whatever, that don't decrease with natalizumab treatment? So I'm not sure if anybody's actually looked at that. He's shaking his head no. I, and it would be something very interesting to understand, and you'll see why for the rest of, you know, when I start speculating even more. But I think that there's, there's evidence, certainly in animal models, that these cells exist and that they don't move around a lot. So I think there is some thought that they uh, may um, not be impacted by natalizumab. Then the other thing are these sort of elusive B cells that we think are, are in the CNS, um, potentially not being depleted by uh, natalizumab, not being particularly well depleted, at least by low dose um, anti-CD20 therapies, and they may be driving some of the inflammation. I realize I shouldn't put compartmentalized, but driving some of the inflammatory uh, inflammation and progression as well. And so this is, again, the super, super simple way of thinking about uh, trafficking in the context of natalizumab. So the reason that I am, the, my project with Biogen is to understand um, how, you know, how we can lower the risk of PML and uh, how that might work molecularly. So just to remind people who aren't familiar with this, um, PML is caused by the JC virus. Uh, it's quite an interesting virus in and of itself. Scientifically, it's very interesting, actually. Um, most of us, 50, 60, 70, with some percent of us, have the virus uh, living in us, or evidence at least of having had a productive infection and that we have antibodies to the virus. Um, about 25% of the people sh of us shed virus in the urine. Um, and this isn't subtle. This isn't like two or three viral par particles. These are 10 to the fifth, 10 to the sixth viral particles per milliliter. So, you know, pretty nice, healthy uh, viral. The virus is pretty happy there. Um, there's a neurotropic form of the virus. So the virus that we find in the urine is not the same as what we find in PML patients. So there's a neurotropic form, um, which is a whole lecture in and of itself. But suffice it to say that, that uh, in every single PML case where we've gotten uh, CSF and we could look at the virus, there's actually one specific mutation in the, in the, in the D region of the of the regulatory part of the virus. So. Um, so one of the observations that has come, uh, sort of uh, been reported recently, is uh, data from two relatively large-ish studies that indicate that if you extend the dosing interval of natalizumab, normally it's 28 days. If you extend it, then you can lower the risk of PML. So there was an independent study, not funded by Biogen, not funded by anybody. These are academics that just got together and did this, um, where they took 1,000 patients in each arm, and some were extended and some weren't. And then there's uh, Biogen finally got interested, and then they went and looked at the touch database to see if they could see the same thing in a prospective way, um, at least with the statistics being prospective. So the multi-center study, the, the reason that Biogen got interested is because the initial data was, was, was uh, tantalizing. So with the extended dosing patients, zero cases, standard dosing cases, uh, patients, four cases, and these patients were pretty heavily weighted toward a higher risk of PML. They had higher JCV index, they had more immunosuppression, they had longer duration of treatment, all of which can predispose toward PML, and yet there seemed to be uh, something that was interesting. 
So Biogen did this touch analysis, predefined what does extended interval dosing mean, and, and just this is sort of what happens. They had three prospective definitions. I'll just look at the third definition, which is uh, fewer than 10 infusions a year. Um, this is real world data. If you actually, I should actually have a picture of the heat map of how, if you look at all these people, how they get their infusions. I mean, you know from your own patients, you know, it's maybe 28 days, 28 days, 34 days, 28 days, 42, you know, it sort of varies. Somebody goes on vacation. So trying to figure out how to define that in the real world was quite difficult. So this is the definition that, uh, there's two definitions, but this is the definition that uh, seems to be the most uh, efficacious. No cases of PML um, in the extended dose group and uh, cases in the number of cases in the uh, standard, the 28-day group. So what about efficacy? We, all of us who used to, you know, who've worked on natalizumab for a long time assumed if you could get trafficking into the brain of these cells to inhibit the virus or take care of the virus, then you would get disease activity. We assumed that, you know, the, that you would, everybody would get in all at once. All the different lymphocytes would get in all at once. Um, that doesn't seem to be the case. Again, there's, uh, there's a number of small studies um, that have looked at this, and none of the studies indicate that there is more disease activity in EID compared to SID. I, I wouldn't believe there's less, but there's not an indication that there's more. Um, the uh, Europe has the, the uh, EMA has uh, put, uh, they were impressed enough with the data that they put it into the label that you guys can think about doing this if you choose to at least. The FDA hasn't gotten there yet. Um, so um, how, you know, on, on a molecular way, one begins to think about how is this working? So in order to think, that's my job. So in order to think about that, um, one of the things I started asking about was the pharmacodynamics and pharmacokinetics. So this is probably all of you who, I was the, I was the teaching assistant in your biochemistry class, and all the pre-medical students when I was a graduate student, they just hated this stuff. But anyway, this is a dose response curve, and the question is, we, we sort of assumed we were out here on the dose response curve, that even if you change the dose a little bit, you wouldn't have much of a change in some of the pharmacodynamic markers. Um, so the question is, are we out here or are we here? How could six weeks, uh, a two-week difference in the dosing change the risk so much? I mean, that just seems unlikely, right? So it turns out that we are sort of at the shoulder. Um, here is a, these are our data from um, uh, John Foley's group. Um, they've been published now. Um, he has a large cohort of natalizumab patients, so it's pretty convenient to have all your patients in one center, and you can just measure them. He draws blood, and then we measure the, these various things. Um, so the half-life of natalizumab is about two weeks. It's 11 to 14 days, depending on which publication you look at, but let's just say it's two weeks. So after, and this is exactly what he sees, this is actually, his EID group is about I think it's 35, 36, 37 days. So it's about five and a half weeks. So this is not a six-week cohort. But he sees about half, you know, the average uh, level of natalizumab in the serum goes down from 35 to 18. Um, you actually see a decrease of about 10% in receptor occupancy. So that's the saturation number. Um, and then the expression, so one of the things that happens when you treat a patient with natalizumab is that the alpha-4 levels on the surface of the lymphocytes goes down by about 50%. This is sort of a normal 
you bind to a receptor and, they, and it sort of uh, can involute, it can degrade, it can do all sorts of things, but it goes down about 50% in natalizumab patients and you begin with extended, inter for, with a five and a half week dosing period, you begin to creep up a little bit. The other thing to notice about this is the range. As I forget who was saying, um, but not everybody's the same. You know, that, that you have in, in a 28 day dosing interval, you have some patients that have 100 micrograms per mil of natalizumab in the serum and some patients that have none, almost. This is weight based to some extent, but not totally. So it's sort of challenging to figure out what's the right interval for a particular patient. So it looks like that, that just by going an extra week and a half or two weeks, that we're changing the pharmacodynamics so that we're likely here on this, on this curve. So um, how can we explain a reduced risk of PML and uh, efficacy remaining, remaining the same? And again, I emphasize appears and I emphasize appears. I'm not asserting it is. I think that there's data that's consistent with that, but I prefer to be a bit careful about those sorts of things. Um, so we developed, as, as good scientists, we sat down and we said, okay, here's the clinical data. We had this hypothesis in our mind of how we thought natalizumab worked. Okay, the clinical data says maybe we were wrong. So we have to revise our thinking and sat down and thought about, okay, what, of our, what are our favorite hypotheses as to how might this might be working? So we came up with you know, a bunch of them, but our favorite is selective immune surveillance, and I'll explain what I mean by that in a, in a couple of minutes. Um, and the reason is, is because if you remember that adhesion, that adhesion um, uh, cartoon, that there is VLA4, VCAM, and LFA1 ICAM, the other drug that is associated with PML to the extent or perhaps even more than natalizumab was an anti-LFA1. So that is two adhesion path, the two main adhesion pathways for blood brain barrier trafficking, and you target one and you target the other, and they both can cause PML. So that sort of pushes you toward thinking about trafficking and immune surveillance. So this was our hypothesis, which I'm about to tell you I don't, don't believe anymore. So this was what I was, um, <laughs> this is what we, I was thinking. It very simple, again, biology is complicated. In order to try to at least develop a working hypothesis that you can test, you have to, you know, develop a model in your head. So this was my model, is that as I mentioned, uh, well, I didn't mention, but I will tell you, that VLA-4 expression on different cell types is different. So, for example, in CD4 cells, the naive and memory cells, same is true in CD8 cells, is that the memory cells have more expression. So I had a, sort of naively assumed that it was the number, not percent saturation, but it was the number of open receptors that would determine whether or not a cell could bind to the endothelium, right? So that if you have a cell with a bunch of, you know, high, like these guys, a high number of receptors on it, and you're 80% saturated, you know, 80% uh, receptor occupancy, you could have four open receptors, and let's just say you need three receptors, open receptors to bind. Let's just say that for argument's sake. So this cell could bind at 80% saturation, but this cell can't. So it's a stoichiometric, I was thinking it was a stoichiometric interaction, you know, and, the, the, and then of course you would need signals. So I was thinking, oh, maybe these are the antiviral cells, these are the MS cells, and you need the signal. And so I've been focusing on this, but Gavin said, no, no, Susan, start focusing on this for this talk. So I started doing that. So um, we did a whole bunch of experiments. We were in the process of doing a bunch of experiments with a bunch of different collaborators. This is a list. I'm not going to go through it. Um, we're also doing some internal work at Biogen. 
So I'm going to talk about two kinds of experiments, and then we're going to get to the model, and then I might let you go to lunch. Um, so the first set of experiments, and again, I, 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 there's a whole bunch of things we're doing, so I'm just going to talk about two of them. One is uh, a trafficking experiment. And this is a, an in vitro blood-brain barrier. So human endothelial cells are, are grown. And they sometimes are activated, sometimes not, in order to get expression of the adhesion molecules on the endothelium. And then the um, lymphocytes are added. And so what we did is we took those, those PBMCs, those lymphocytes from patients or from healthy controls, but from healthy controls that I'll start with, and you start adding natalizumab in vitro to begin to block the receptor. So you have all, you've got your B cells, T cells, CD8, CD4s, everybody's in there. You start adding natalizumab in, in sort of small increments, and this is the, you know, this is the range we were using. You know, we knew what we wanted to do. Um, so between 100 and 1 microgram per mil, or 0.1 or 0.01 micrograms per mil, uh, was our dose of natalizumab. And we said, OK, who binds first? You know, which are the ones that are going to bind first? And we assumed it would be, I assumed, it would be these guys. They have more receptors, so they'll bind faster as you lower the concentration of natalizumab. Um, so it turns out that wasn't necessarily the case. So, so this is just some preliminary data from, from Nicholas Schwab's lab. Um, and it looks like they, um, and this is also from patients. So he has SID as standard interval dosing and extended interval dosing patient PBMCs. And he does some of these experiments in their own serum. But basically, it's looking like it's the CD4 cells that bind before the CD8 cells. So this was, now, you know, in my mind and in some of my, my colleagues that I said, what the heck? CD4s cause MS. Everybody knows that. And, you know, CD8s are the antiviral cells. So what's going on? Um, this, doesn't, this doesn't fit with our preconceived notions of what these cells do, but it seemed to be, at least in this model, the case. Then the other piece of data that's consistent, that's consistent with this, which makes you believe it more, of course, is we took S, uh, CSF from SID and EID patients. And we, we being the royal we, this is uh, an experiment we did, uh, are doing with several groups the first data that came in is from Phil de Jaeger's lab, um, where you take the CSF, immediately get the cells, and do single cell RNA seq. So, um, just as it, this was a question Gavin asked me this morning, so I thought I'd throw in a quick slide. Do you know? Does the cellular content of the CSF reflect trafficking under natalizumab? I've been obsessing about this ever since I started looking at this data. I would query all the neurologists I would meet saying, do you know where the cells from the CSF come from? And, <laughs> and they, I would get this interesting answer. You know, either they were quoting the introduction of some textbook somewhere that said they come from the Cori plexus, or if I said, really, do you know? And then the answer was not really. So I was trying to figure out what am I seeing in the CSF and how does that reflect what's in the parenchyma and what cell trafficking is. And finally, I remembered this paper from um, uh, Lohman et al., Louisa Klotz's lab, again from Münster, where she was looking at untreated MS, she was looking at natalizumab-treated MS, and she was looking at fingolimod-treated MS and looking at CSF cells. And this made me think, OK, what she's seeing in the CSF is a reflection, potentially, of what we think the drug is doing, and that is inhibiting cells from getting into the brain. So I felt better when I saw this. Um, I'm not going to show you Phil's data, um, because it 
it's a, you know preliminary, and I heard it was gonna, this was going to be on the web, and it's not my data, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm going to explain to you what we saw. So this is published, again, from the Lohman paper. And I call these things clouds. So each dot rep re represents a cell. And these are, these are segregated, for those of you who don't know. It's by the message, what message they're expressing. So for example, uh, these CD4 cells are, you look for CD4 uh, message. C you look for CD3 because it's a T cell. And then you look for CD4 and you say, ah, these are all the CD4 cells. Each of these are subsets of CD4 cells. CD8, you say, oh, these don't express CD4. They s express the message for CD8. So you can separate the cells best based on the mRNA expression. And you get these clouds. And so what we have that now for SID and EID patients. And so what we learned from Phil uh, Diegers, the Columbia Group's experiments, is that A, there seems to be enough cells to actually an analyze, which we were worried about in natalizumab patients. Um, B, and there are clear differences between SID and EID, which I had given this experiment about a 10% chance of working. Um, but again, you never know. Um, so that was pretty amazing to me. And it appears that the CD4 cells and the monocytes actually increase in EID. So any cells that are increasing in EID, one has to think, assuming that our observations are correct and that the efficacy is similar, EID, SID. So it must be that these cells are not the ones that are causing MS, overt inflammatory MS activity. Because they're getting in and people aren't getting disease. So, and that is consistent with what the Schwab data was, is that the CD4 cells may get in faster in the in vitro data. So combining those things, I have this ridiculously simple working hypothesis, super speculative um, uh, picture. And this is, again, a little bit more granularity, untreated MS. Everybody can get in if they, if they get the right signals. You have the tissue resident cells. You have the B cells, et cetera, et cetera. Standard interval dosing, everybody gets inhibited, but these guys are already there. The monocytes seem to get in somewhat anyway. Um, and then you have these, uh, the, you've got some CD4 cells getting in. So that's one, now, now this is super simplistic, but there's an interesting, so what about JC? How are we explaining the, the reduction in JC virus, which isn't the question, but it's interesting nonetheless, is if these, it turns out these tissue resident, there's a, there's a couple of publications about tissue resident CD8 cells being the ones that drive your antiviral response, but that these CD8 cells have to be activated by CD4 cells. So the idea would be is that you, you release the breaks, you release the inhibition by lowering the natalizumab concentration. Your CD4 cells, you know, a sub, probably some subset of them, gets in initially. Uh, and that can activate these CD8 cells to do their anti-JCV thing, and you can lower the risk of PML. However, what we know is that, that these cells, the CD8s and the B cells, they don't, see, according to the CSF and the in vitro data, they don't seem to be increasing in EID. So I would postulate, again, just a working hypothesis, which I will discard immediately if I have different data, um, that maybe it's more these cells that are driving MS or a subset of these cells that aren't getting in. You know, I mean, you've got probably 50 different flavors of CD4 cells. But the, the, let's just, for fun, say, OK, it's these B cells and CD8 cells that actually drive MS. 
which is one of the things that I think was discussed earlier is that, that in, in, in MS brains, you see a lot of CD8 cells. Um, so this is the summary. So that was pretty fast. Um, so this is, and I'm going to go through this, actually. I hate it when people read slides, but I'm going to do this. Um, so when the natalizumab dosing interval is extended, it appears that PML risk decreases and efficacy is maintained. So that's what we, we believe we, we're seeing clinically. We hypothesize that this is due to selective immune cell trafficking. The anti-JCV cells are allowed to traffic into the brain somehow, or the helper anti-JCV cells, the MS-causing cells are still prevented from trafficking to the brain. That would explain the clinical observations. So the preliminary data, I have to emphasize preliminary, I should have circled that, is that the cells that are still inhibited from trafficking are the CD8 T cells and B cells. And if you're maintaining efficacy, then we speculate that these might be the cells that are contributing to MS activity. Again, I'm perfectly comfortable saying, and maybe this is more likely, that it's specific set, subsets of CD4 and CD8 cells may mediate these various activities, and we just haven't gotten the granularity. But the beauty of the single-cell RNA-seq data is that you can, um, Within the B cell subsets, you can figure out which clusters have different chemokine receptors, um, which clusters have uh, granzyme B. You know, you can look and see what's being expressed in these various subsets and which ones are being enriched in the um, in the EID patients versus which ones are not. And I think that's all I have to say.